Welcome in to a new 1v1 here on the SDH Network. My name is Jason Longshore and joined today by Atlanta United Academy Director Tony Annan. Tony, how was the vacation first off? Uh, much needed after a very long season. Uh, it was nice to get away with the family and try to turn off as much as I could, obviously watching first team A2 games while on vacation, but it was a nice little break, much, much needed. Yeah, good little story to send you off on break, and, and something that I wanted to start with is George Campbell, and a player that I remember seeing him for the first time at Generation Adidas Cup when we streamed one of those games, and, and talking to you afterwards and asking, who is who is George Campbell? He's a player that I hadn't really heard much about, and he makes the rise all the way from there to a homegrown contract. Yeah. I've said it before, and I said I think I said in the interview was George is one of those stories which is inspiring for everybody that everyone can relate to as well. Um, you know, at 13, 14, he was gangly, uncoordinated, and didn't know where to play him. You know, the next two years we picked him, but we didn't really know where he was going to play, and we just knew there was something there, but he wasn't one of our top three or four players by any means. So then... You know, 16, 17, he starts to get coordinated a bit. He starts to fill out a little bit. and His technical ability's always been there. It's just been hit or miss what you got with him. And then uh, he's just one of those kids who blossomed at 17, 18. And it happens a lot. And that's why you've got to be patient when you talk about development of a player. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to pick the developed player at a younger age. Um, but George was one of those late bloomers who came on. And I'm thrilled that played well enough at USL and did well enough with our academy that the club felt strongly about signing him as a homegrown. George feels like one of those players that before Atlanta United existed and you know even further back would have probably been lost in the shuffle. I don't know if he would have risen up the charts to even make a big college run or, or eventually get a pro deal. Those late bloomers got lost in the past. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think uh, given the vehicle that he's been given here at Atlanta and the resources that's been put behind him, it's it's really helped him establish himself. I mean, George came to Georgia when he was 12, turned 13. And I remember the Philadelphia Union staff, one of them saying, yeah, he's fine. You know, you guys can take him and he's not going to come to anything. He's, you know, he's not that great a player, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I bet they're kicking themselves now. But, you know, again, how were they to know at 12 and 13 that George was going to blossom and kick on at 17? Because it was really 17 where he got moved back to centre-back in Mexico against Pachuca and had a great game. And we said, you know what, this may be where he's going to play. And then the next 12 months he played there and did very, very well. So he, uh, he could well have got lost in the shuffle in a normal system. But like I said, the resources and the opportunities... He was afforded Atlanta United with USL and training with the first team and things like that have really, really sort of pushed his development, in my opinion. So oh, he would have been a very good college player. I'm glad you mentioned the international play, too, because that's a, a really key element that you talk about the advances from, from the older days where you're developing players outside of the pro system. Having that opportunity for George to play in the back against Pachuca and it felt like this past year for the Academy, the international play with the Manchester City Cup, playing international teams, the Mercedes-Benz event in Germany, sending different teams to different parts of the world and playing teams from different parts of the world. That was a huge focus, it felt like. Yeah, I think in our previous conversations, we've talked about it. You know, the whole, where's the bar and how do we show them the bar and how do we motivate them that, this is not the top level of football and we need to, to push on. Our 17s this year are going to England in two weeks. They'll play Tottenham first day. They'll play Man United second day. They'll play Everton and they'll play Burnley, four Premier League academies. We'll watch two Premier League games and then we come home. And then in October, the same team, the same squad will go to Medellin and play Deportivo and Nacional. Um, and then they'll go to Mexico in March. I mean, we've got a, we've set our 17s up for a real challenging year because we feel 
number one, we've got some real prospects in there. And number two, we understand that the games competition has uh, is evolving in the US, which is great. But we still need to, to really push them on the international level to open their eyes. The 17-year-old group was, the U-17s was something that jumped out to me in our, our last USL championship match where we had Loudoun United and Ryan Murphy, who just took over on the USL championship side for DC United, talked about his U-17s being kind of a special generation and, and they were really putting a lot of an emphasis on bringing those guys through at the USL level and, and getting them ready for those next steps. It sounds like this group, you kind of have the same vision. The upcoming 17s? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Will Riley, Jordan, Matthews, Claggett, uh, Tubbs, I think they all appeared in those last couple of USL games, which mm -hmm. there are current U19 players. We'll continue to push them. But our U17 group, which is 2003-2004, it's about half and half, really. We've got some real prospects, we feel, in that group. And the only way to really find out about them and really sort of put them to the sword of the development would be to uh, take them out of their comfort zone and take them to places like Colombia and England and Mexico and see how they react and see how they cope. Because coping is one of the one of the most important pieces of becoming a professional footballer is can you cope? And those are the tests that we put out for them. And luckily enough, we've got the investment and the resources to do that. So, yeah, 17s are a hopeful group for us. So it feels like three years in now, and I know you've learned a lot, and there's been tweaks and, and things that have changed here and there, and I want to get into that. But something that felt like a, a bit of just a, a progress report on where your first group that came through was, your first group that started as a U12 group three years ago, went out and won the Manchester City Cup. How proud were you to see those younger guys who a lot of them were there from day one kind of get it yeah it was great it was uh, I flew out there to watch the games and spend some time with them um, yeah it was a really challenging tournament to be honest and I didn't know how we were going to do um, hadn't really seen much of the 2005s around the country but even the Mexican teams were very complimentary that group turned around a couple of weeks later and actually went to Madrid um, and did very well in Madrid as well. And Steve got to coach against uh, Xabi Alonso when they played Real Madrid, which was awesome. And oh, they were very complimentary of that group. So that group, like you said, was the first ones we picked at U12. And the first ones, some of the first ones that represented us in Dallas in the first GA Cup. So we feel like that's our first group. Like Those are the guys that started with us at U12 and have gone through the process and are still going through the process. And we didn't really change much of that squad this year. We left a lot of the players intact because we feel pretty strongly about them as well, that we have a very good group. Not only are they athletic, but they're smart and they're, uh, they're very, a lot of them are intrinsically motivated to, to, to be a pro. So it's good to see that the culture has rubbed off on them and they are sort of all in with Atlanta United, you know? One of the things that's jumped out to me about this progression as you get three years in and, and you learn different things with the, each group that comes through, but also the individuals, you touched on it at the Generation Adidas Cup uh, this year with a great presentation and you talked to our friend Felipe Cardenas from The Athletic about it, trying to balance that team development and group development and the overall academy development with the individual <clears throat> development and, and how at times, you know, those individual plans have to be expanded. And it's something you mentioned specifically with George Bello and now we'll carry on to others. How difficult of a process has that been to get that deep into it where you're creating an individual plan for those types of prospects? Yeah, it's a challenge. <clears throat> Not only with time, with school, you know, even down to nutrition and making sure they're fed properly at the right time. So it's a challenge to get everything lined up, <clears throat> um, especially the schooling piece, because obviously the individual development has to take place when 
they're in school most of the time because we can't do individual development the same night as training. We can touch on things, but we can't really get stuck into it unless we bring them in at a different time. So timing is a challenge, but we're sort of overcoming those problems with the flexible school systems that we're working with. Uh, we've got great partnerships with some schools that are allowing our prospects out to do individual work. But when you get into the individual work, you obviously disrupt the teamwork. Um, and I think I said the same thing to Felipe. You have to make a decision. Are we in this to win championships, win leagues, you know, win, win against the local teams that we play <clears throat> and protect reputation? Or are we in this to produce professional footballers who can play under pressure at the highest level? And I mean, the answer is we have to produce individuals and maintain the teams as best we can. But the team concept takes a back seat when you're really trying to push on the individual. doesn't mean that we don't care about our team. doesn't mean we don't care about player number nine and ten because we really care that they get education and they go to college on scholarships. But we have to shoot off in different directions and take different avenues to make sure that the individual, the bellow of the world, the Campbell of the world, make it through. <clears throat> So while people say, oh, you know, you lost this game, you lost that game, that's OK. It's fine. They can talk and say, well, they lost against them and they lost against them. And that's because we've been manipulating our teams and pushing players on. And we're not training all together all the time and practicing team concepts. It's not what we do. So it's fine. You know, we're happy with where we are. You know, we're happy with the process and. That's kind of where we stand at the moment. How have some of the changes just at the club in 2019 in general uh, affected your job and your role with a new manager at the MLS level, with Frank DeBoer, and a new manager at the USL Championship level with Stephen Glass, although he came from the academy? What are some of the differences that have been here in 2019? Um, I mean, with Stephen starting there, he and I have a great relationship. Obviously, I hired him in the academy and I pushed him to get the USL job as well. So with Steven, it's easy. It's very easy because it's. I would like Will Riley to get 30 minutes and push him on. I would like Brandon Claggett. I'd like Jordan Matthews. I'd like these guys to get exposed, Steven. And Steven says, no problem. Because Steven understands his role in the club and what the team, the USL team is there to be competitive, but it's also a developmental tool as well. But it certainly needs to be competitive. Um, but Stephen has no fear at putting a kid into the USL level and sort of putting his feet to the fire, which is a great thing for the academy. And I help facilitate and manage the, that that movement. Um, with Frank, obviously, new coach, new philosophies, new new everything really, new staff. It's been fine. Um, you know, he's in a process of well, is changing the first team, so hasn't had. A lot to say with the academy. He's, you know, he's. We've talked and he's given his opinion on youth development, and it's very helpful. Um, and again, good relationships with him, good relationships with the staff. So it hasn't really been an upheaval for the academy. And I think many of the good clubs in the world do not let their first team staff or philosophy affect their academy process. Because if you if you allow that. You know, modern football, every two or three years, the head coach changes. Your development process of a professional footballer is six to seven years. You know, five minimum. So you can't let what's happening at the top affect your process down below. And I think Frank understands that. He's given his opinion. He's given his thoughts. And they're all helpful. Everything's helpful. But to be honest, the changes have not really affected how we operate as an academy or our philosophy, or our playing principles, or how we teach. So, Makes total sense, and it's something that I think a lot of people who are, are maybe newer to it, and especially newer to watching a, a club develop talent from within, maybe don't get. Maybe you think, well, it's the first team managers overseeing everything, and they're hands-on with all of it, and that's just, like you say, you have managers coming and going every couple of years. It's not realistic. One thing that jumped out to me, though, was in Costa Rica, game one of the CONCACAF Champions League, 
George Bellow was in that starting lineup, and and we know the injury trouble he's had, and he's he's back playing with Atlanta United too now. But Frank's belief in a player like Bellow, who had come through the academy, shows his buy-in, in my opinion, anyway, in in young talent coming through and what the academy had done up to this point. Yeah, I mean Frank says it plain and simple: if he's good enough, he's old enough. That's uh, if he's good enough, I'll play him. That's his philosophy. Obviously, he was at Ajax, where that's the forefront of their philosophy. But Frank said to us at the beginning of the year, if the kid is good enough, I will play him. So, you know, George, I believe, fully fit, will be our starting left back on the first team, in my opinion. So, you know, look for that coming down the pipe here as he gets fitter. I think Frank gives him a chance again. He's still only 17, remember? So he's still in his process of development and he's still got stuff to learn but like I said for me Frank's philosophy is if he's good enough he's old enough how do you feel overall the the homegrown process has gone with not just your the players who have signed from the academy to MLS but your academy players like an Alessandro Castro Jackson Conway who have signed USL professional deals as well how do you feel like that has that process has gone for you um I think it's been good. You know, at the end of the day, and this is what I said to every kid in the academy, a professional contract's a professional contract, whether it's got USL tagged to it or homegrown tagged to it. Someone's seen enough in you and pushed you enough to sign a professional contract with Atlanta United. And a lot of players around the world, in Europe, in South America, and wherever else you want to talk about, sign what's called a reserve team contract and don't get thrown in at the first team level straight away and spend two or three years in the reserves. That's similar to here. We're signing players like Castro, Conway, you know, Kisadu. All those kids that came out of the academy were given professional deals and given an opportunity to prove their ability in the reserve team level, which is, in the process, the next step. You know, you've got a bellow who is exceptional, and he goes from academy straight into the first team. That doesn't happen very often. I hope it happens more in the future. If we do our job, it should. But at the end of the day, anywhere you go in the world, most 17, 18-year-olds are signed to professional contracts and start in the reserves. Unless the league that they're playing in is a second sort of tier league that allows young kids to play you know, a lot of a lot of football. So I think the process is right. I think especially over here, you know, the immaturity of our players need they need to go through that process. Jackson's having a tough year where he had two golden years with the Academy and sort of ran the rule. Then now he's struggling a bit and he's having to work things out and it's exactly what he needs. So the process. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned Jackson because I've felt that way too. But in the last few weeks, it feels like things are are starting to click for him a little differently than they were earlier. Absolutely, you know, it's taken four or five months to get to this point. But that this is what I'm trying to say. There is a process to it. It's not mm-hmm. instant. It's not. It's the same with management. There's a process to management. It doesn't just happen overnight and everything changes and everything's fine. You know, very rarely there's a process to shaping a player the way you want to get him. It's not just he should be in the first team because he signed a professional contract. Not at all. He has to earn it. He has to learn. He has to prove. These kids are 17 years old. The development window is still open for them. We're just putting them in a different area to develop them with different challenges that is more difficult than the academy. And that's part of the process. But you have to be patient in development. It's not an overnight fix. It's not an overnight result. It takes time. You've mentioned it a lot about Atlanta United 2 and, and the USL Championship, the reserve team, and how important of a, a step it is on the academy side with which you do. There's a lot of talk right now about the future of USL and, and what direction they go in with the second teams. Do they, they put them in USL League One, as we've seen a few clubs do? Do they kind of let them figure themselves out? Do they have them in USL Championship? What's your feeling on, on that and balancing, like you said, the, 
the results versus the individual development at that stage at the USL level? Yeah, I mean, look, we don't know where it's going. We are sort of in the dark of where it's going to. But for right now, we're trying to put a competitive team on the field. You know, I know there's been a lot of social stuff that's gone out and said, you know, Atlanta United 2 suck, Atlanta United 2 this and the other, and why are we doing this? And It's investment in, in our players. And it's not just in the young 17-year-olds. I mean, we've got a good squad of players that are developing and, we're trying to be as competitive as we can because that is number one. We have to be competitive. It's a professional team. But we do use it as a development vehicle. And at times, things are going to break down and things are going to go wrong. That's football. You know, you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because of one result or two results. And I understand fans want to win. Fans want to see Atlanta United win games. That's part of Atlanta United. But at the end of the day, it's not like we walk out there and try to just throw the game away on development. It's not what we're doing. We're trying to be competitive and we're trying to do things, but obviously against teams that are seasoned or have a lot of vets or have been around a long time and have been doing it and have got it right, yeah, we're going to struggle. It's our second season. But we are trying to be competitive and we do want that team to be competitive and we will always try to play in the most competitive environment we can with our Atlanta United 2 team. But on the other hand, we have to develop pros for the first team, and that is the best way to do it. 100%. And and I think if you watch the, the twos on a regular basis, you see, yeah, a bad result here, and then a response the next week or the following week and, and you see that progress and, and watching this season for me, watching guys like Campbell and Vent and Riley, you know, make that progression from, yeah, mistakes happen, but you're not seeing the same mistakes made game after game and you're seeing steps taken for all of them to get further along in their career and guys like Claggett and Matthews who are getting some of their first tastes of it are contributing and, and are finding ways to, to be part of that group and contribute. I mean, Brandon Claggett's first game was against Red Bulls 2 at Red Bulls. Red Bulls 2 have, you know, they've got their reserve team down to a science almost, how they use it and how they do it. But we have to put them, sort of give them the baptism of fire, basically, with, by doing it, by throwing them in there and saying, right, how do you do against them? Yeah, we got battered. You know, we didn't we didn't do very well that day. But again, you don't abandon everything just because of that. If you look at some of the results where we where we lose games, we actually played the better football. We actually created chances and could have won those games. But that's football, and that's what people have got to understand. It's it doesn't always go the way you want it to, and it's it's frustrating for us as it is for the fan. But there's a process to everything, and we have to be patient. Yeah, nobody really measures the success of a club based off trophies won with a reserve team or even with academy teams for that matter. But they do measure it on players who are coming through. And I, I wanted to ask you about an addition to the academy staff that has been talked about a lot on both sides of the, the Atlantic Ocean. Jack Collison coming in from West Ham United, joining the academy staff, a former pro. What is Jack going to bring to this group and some of these young players coming through? Yeah, I mean, we added two new guys this year because obviously I stepped off to manage everything and I'm off the sideline for, for now. So For now, you say? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <clears throat> somebody, uh, so somebody said to me, you know, oh, Jack's, you know, he's a young guy and <clears throat> how much experience does he have? Well, to be fair, he's played in 120 Premier League games played nearly 20 national team games for Wales, brings a wealth of experience. His demeanour with the players is excellent. His knowledge of the game is excellent. He has his UEFA Pro, which there's not many of them in the US. Um, so, yeah, Jack brings, just from a credibility standpoint with the players, number one, he's coming from West Ham United, whose academy is one of the best in England. So he's got pedigree, he's got licenses, he's got experience. And to be honest, he's a wonderful guy, a really good guy who is willing to learn, who wants to get on and wanted a new challenge. And the US was 
where he wanted to be with his family. So fortunately for us, we got him in the academy and I've already been out there every day with him. We've been training two weeks and his sessions are very, very good. And I couldn't wish for somebody to come in behind me and sort of carry on the work we've been doing. So really excited about Jack. Uh, obviously, Zach Herald as well. Young guy, another young guy who's eager to learn and kick on. And sometimes those are the guys that you can mould to be Atlanta United coaches rather than an older guy who may be set in his ways, but's a really good coach. Because our coaching team is a team as well. It's not a bunch of individuals doing their own thing. They have to follow our philosophy, our curriculum, our way of teaching. So you have to be an educator as well as an experienced player. And I think we got it with Jack and Zach. They're really good people. How would you sum up that philosophy for people who are kind of new and, and look at it from the outside? And, you know, you've had all the questions this year with, with Tata Martino now gone, Frank DeBoer coming in. How different is the philosophy for you at the academy level? How would you sum up the, the philosophy of the Atlanta United Academy? I mean, our philosophy hasn't changed since day one with the academy. And that was partly because of Tata and what Tata did here and how we how we felt about the way we played. So our academy will always be a high-pressing, high-energy team who will press teams, who will try and win the ball back quickly and attack quickly. We'll always play out the back, regardless of who we're playing against. You know, But we'll adapt to what the game gives us, but we'll always try and play out the back the same way and dominate the game. That's our philosophy, is to dominate the game. Not always dominate in possession, but dominate the game. So... When you watch our teams, we'll always play the same way. We won't abandon our principles and philosophy at all to win a game. And that's some of you know what you've seen in the DA this year. You know, We put out a young team who's trying to play against an older team or a team that trains together on a regular basis and doesn't move its players. And yeah, you lose those games because of physicality sometimes. Sometimes you don't play that well and a team sets up to beat you. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a bullseye on our first team's back. There's a bullseye on the reserve teams and the bullseye on the academy because we win, because we're a high-profile team. There's a bullseye. Everybody plays us with 10% more than what they do everybody else. And we're okay with that. You know, we have to accept it and we're not going to win every game. We're not going to dominate every game, although we will try. Um, But those are the challenges we face and those are the challenges we like. We don't want teams to come in here and sort of bow down to what we are or who we are, the brand. And you get you get a lot of youth teams coming in here and packing it in with 11 men in their own half to get the result against Atlanta United so they can say, yeah, hey, we beat Atlanta United. That's awesome. That's their tactics. That's how they want to teach the game. Not a problem. No one's going to argue with that. But we will do our thing and play our way regardless of who we're playing. I thought you could see that in in that Manchester City Cup final. And that was where it really came home for me because I remember watching the broadcast and all of the talk about the the central midfield and they're so small and and how are they going to handle the physicality and just played right through it. Absolutely. Johnny Vial, Andrew Carlton, um, Chirinos. I mean, those three are probably the most physically immature players in their age group in the country. You know, they all went in with the national team and the feedback was, yeah, fantastic players, but, you know, physically they can't play international football. Okay, no problem. But we feel we'll be patient, we'll wait. and (laughs) We feel we've got three of the best midfielders in the country, technically smart, intelligent, technical players who, yeah, they're not physical right now and we will lose games because of that with them in there. But we're going to stand by it because eventually, you and I both know, those kids will grow, those kids will fill out, those kids will get stronger and we'll have superb players on our hands. So it is. It's easy to see. I mean, Monterey were monsters. Mm -hmm. But we played right through their press. We played, we switched through them. And we, for me, we played better football than they did. So for me, that's progress. And it's, uh, it's promising. We can't get carried away with winning, like you say, in the Man City Cup, the trophies. We never get carried away with it, but really, really promising for us to see us play our way, play through teams. 
that were bigger, stronger, and honestly more aggressive than us. So I want to get into a couple big picture things with you real quick as we wrap up. The new development academy structure, and, and you mentioned how you know you, you get into some scenarios where you're playing teams that are on the older side of the age group, or really focused on on size and and physicality and athleticism. How do you think the new structure that's coming down the line? How do you think that's going to help Atlanta United? Um, obviously, they tiered the 19s, so the 19s divisions tiered. So there's two tiers of football. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with the teams they tiered, but that's up to the federation and how they did it, how they saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, for us, it's given us a really good challenge in season for our 19s. We play a lot of MLS clubs. We have to travel a bit more, but we have a really challenging season for the 19s, which for those late bloomers is, is great. The 17s division, again, we'll have... We actually have two 17 squads. We've got like an underdeveloped squad, and then we've got our what we call our sort of developed squad. So they're they're on two different sort of seasons. But um, overall, we feel we have a really good, challenging season ahead of us, um, and some meaningful games where we can really, you know, hone in on the development aspect before and after the games. The uh, getting the players to sort of self-reflect is really important to us. And with these games, last season, some of them were just kind of meaningful, okay games. Some of them were not that meaningful. But we feel like the the structure, the, the new cup, everything else that's been introduced, we have a pretty challenging season, including GA Cup, our international travel. You know, we feel like we've got a, a, a real good, games program it's not perfect but it's a step forward for us as Atlanta United I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody else but sure. as Atlanta United we feel it's a, we've got a good challenging season ahead of us for the teams we want to be challenged some clubs feel pretty strongly that they do not and I don't disagree with them but <clears throat> again I have to worry about Atlanta United and solely about Atlanta United Let's take the Atlanta United hat off for a second. And now that you're three years into this, how do you think Atlanta United's presence has benefited the rest of the youth scene across the Atlanta area, but also the Southeast? Because, I mean, you're, you're drawing players in not just from Metro Atlanta now. Yeah, I mean, we've, from day one, we've, uh, we've had a, a homestay program where we've brought in what we feel are talented players from around the uh, Southeast, which we'll continue to do. <clears throat> um, but I mean if you look at Atlanta you look at Concord Fire and UFA in particular look how well they did this season in the DA they went all the way to the quarterfinals in the final that speaks volumes for Atlanta I think and I'm not saying Atlanta United is the cause of that but I think the excitement around the game the development of players the the people in organisations like that who are working as professionally as they can with the resources they have. <clears throat> They've elevated Atlanta just as much as Atlanta United elevated Georgia. They've done the same this year. Um, hopefully they can repeat that and keep doing that. <clears throat> I mean, you've got great clubs, SSA, GSA. They're all elevating what they're doing. They're all doing really well in their respected leagues. I mean, even KSA. Right. They won a national championship at the US YS level this year, which is great. It only puts Atlanta on the map <clears throat> more and more and more. So you talk about a powerhouse state like California and New Jersey and places like that that have been powerhouses. You look at Atlanta now and there's three national championships in Atlanta this year, you know, so at various levels. But I think Atlanta United's had a really positive impact on the way people work, the organization the facilities, I think we've had an impact on the club scene as well as obviously the professional level as well. So for me, it's a positive. Georgia is in a real positive light, not only because of Atlanta United, but also the club scene and the people that are working in the club scene that I have a massive respect for. So outside of Georgia, you're going to have a couple MLS teams in the Southeast coming soon. We know Nashville for sure starting up next year. 
looks like Charlotte is becoming more of a, a possibility. And also you have the USL League One and USL Championship teams popping up. What kind of an effects do you think that has on what you do with more competition in the region? Competition is good. Competition can only help you get better. You know, I remember Dallas the first year when we played them in the final. Lucci came over and he said, what you guys are doing in Atlanta only raises the bar for us and everybody else. So competition's good. You've got to embrace it. You can't be scared of it. You can't be worried about it. You just It keeps motivating you to work harder. And the more MLS clubs that come in, the more USL academies, the more clubs are doing for their players, it's only a good thing for the game as a whole. We'll do what we do and we'll do it the best we can and we'll try to keep evolving and we'll try and stay ahead of the curve. Um, and competition helps you do that. You know, you don't want to be the fat cat getting lazy. You want to be the guy out in front running as fast as you can to stay ahead. So competition is motivation for me. I'm not worried about it. Obviously, player pools are affected by more clubs sort of being able to provide opportunities for their top talent so they don't have to come to Atlanta or, you know, move from North Carolina to Atlanta or from North Florida, which is Orlando's territory now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, competition's good. It can only help the game. It can only help us. And like I said, it can only push the game to another level. So final question. Three years in the books. You've got more competition coming. You're you're getting pushed in different directions at different levels of the game. And, and now, like you mentioned, that bullseye on Atlanta United's back. What are some of the things that you have on your checklist that you want to add or, or evolve or upgrade in the academy? Ooh, I'm not going to give you all the details on that. Well, you can't give them all away. <laughs> I understand that. But I'll tell you this. <clears throat> I will say this. Arthur, Darren, Carlos, Steve, our CEO, are all in on evolving this thing and not standing still. So investment will be made, resources will be given, and a lot of the ideas that have been on the back burner for the last couple of years while we set up, while we set up shop, I think are going to come to fruition in the next two to three years. And it will only improve what we do, it will only elevate what we do, and it will make us very aggressive in the market as far as we want to be the leader. We don't want to be second or third. And I think... You know Arthur and you know Darren and Carlos. They're not going to stand still either. Whether it's first team, academy, facilities, things are going to change only for the better. And we can do more than, we've, than we're currently doing that will help everybody continue to be successful. That's my answer for you. That's fair enough. You teased enough. I, I think people will be excited to hear that. Tony Ann, an Academy Director, Atlanta United. Congratulations on all of the success, and I'm sure we'll be catching up again soon on another one of these 1v1s. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for your time. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency, or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois.